Josh, we got to go back down memory lane. Your rookie season, literally the first game of your NBA career. And everybody's seen that video circulating. I think Kareem, Kareem has said something about somebody uh, else getting violent, and then they dropped the, uh, the Kent Benson one-hitter quitter video. That's your first game. If you actually watch the tape, you, I think you're on like Jamal Wilkes or somebody. So take me back to that, that first NBA game. Kareem's back in Milwaukee. Obviously, Ken Benson, you know, you guys were both drafted in the same class. We hit him with that joint. What are you thinking? That's like a, couple, that's like a minute or two into the game, right? Yeah, first, the first NBA game, first minute or two. Uh, I remember Ken Benson had made some statements in the papers that morning. Uh, the Milwaukee Sentinel, the morning paper, used to have a morning paper and, a, and the evening, the journal and now they've combined them. But to Bob Wolf, uh, who was this World War II veteran with one arm missing with a black, the black glove and you know, <laughs> pencil in his mouth. You know. <laughs> but he'd made some comments to, to Bob Wolf that he was gonna you know, be physical with Kareem, gonna rough him up, gonna you know, elbow him, just kinda see how he responds. So that was already out there. Mm-hmm. You know? And so that was already out there. And so when Kent um, caught Kareem, and Kent, Kent tells a story that I don't remember this like he does, but, but I'm sure the video would bear it out. But he, he said he jumped over Kareem for an offensive rebound. He, you know, he, he shot, a, shot a hook over him to start the game off, how, how well he was playing. That's what Kent says. So he thinks a lot of it, or some of it, had to do with the fact that he was kind of showing up Kareem early just in terms of his aggressiveness. I don't quite remember it that way, but that's what Kent says. <laughs> and so when Kent elbowed Kareem in the, in the solar plexus, Kareem doubles over. I'm guarding Jamal. I can't see any of this. All I hear is, just like that, just, that's all I hear. I mean, loud enough to turn around, and then that's when I see Kent stumbling around, you know, just stumbling, and then I see Kareem dancing over, get up, get up, get up. So I walk up to Kareem, I was just like, he's just like, Cap, he's not getting up, man, get him up, back up, back up, he's not getting up, you know, <laughs> he's not getting up. And, uh, and, 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 and Kent was, uh, he was messed up that, it, pretty much that entire season. He, he, had, he, had, he had, I remember, I, I remember him saying this, you know, that, how you doing, Benny? He's like, oh, you know, I still have headaches and I see light flashes all the time. And I'm just, you know, he had a hard time with that in terms of uh, migraines and everything else, the, the uh, residual effects of it. And just coming in, he said, so first of all, he shouldn't have been the number one pick. I should have been the number one pick. <laughs> we're going to get there. Yeah, number I, one. I, I know <laughs> so, well, 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 he should have been the number one pick anyway. But, yeah, yeah, uh, he should have been. Well, we had Swin Nader. Uh-huh. From UCLA, Bill Walton's backup, Swin averaged 15 and 12 rebounds again. We needed a rebounded big man to, to dominate inside. We had one. They traded Swin to Buffalo to get the number three pick so they could draft me and take Ken Benson number one. And, 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 and David Falk, the great David Falk, Michael Jordan's agent, he's sitting down with myself and my parents at dinner, and uh, he told my mom and dad, well, you know they're drafting Ken Benson number one because he's white. And why did he say that to my mother? We know he's white, that damn it. We know damn well he's white. You ain't got to tell us that. We know he's white. Why you, you know, what do you, you know? And, and, but, but so that was kind of that great white hope type mm-hmm. of a, an, an approach that the league was looking for at that time. It was too black. It was too much going on. And, and so, and, 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 and Quinn Buckner, my teammate, and, uh, you know, it's 40 plus years later, so I'm not really throwing him under the bus, but he told me, he told Don Nelson, he's like, they don't draft Ken Benson, number one, you know, he's, 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 he's not so much soft, but he's injured a lot. He had a bad back injury, I think his senior year at Indiana, missed a lot of games. And so he, he said he tried to warn them that he wasn't the Ken Benson who was a great player his junior year, that he'd actually kind of peaked out and was, was uh, more of a journeyman type of a good role-playing center as opposed to a guy that needed to be the number one pick and the pressure that came with it. So, mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, that, that was a crazy night, man. And uh, again, I just remember Kareem on his toes dancing like, get up, get up, get up, get up. You know, and uh, yeah, that was crazy. What was that fine? $40? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe a couple, maybe a thousand, couple thousand, maybe. I think he was, a, I want to say one of the largest fines in history. Maybe. Oh, that was? I, I oh, believe so. Then? Maybe a couple oh, okay. of grand or something like that. You can't do that in Milwaukee. There was no, no suspensions and stuff like well, that. Well, he broke his hand. Oh. With the punch, I believe. I believe. It gotta, I got to look that up. Don't, don't quote me on that. But I thought he missed some games after that because of the punch. But I'm not 100% sure on that. So let's move on to your second season. Uh, you know, arguably the best season of your career in the league. You knocked Dr. J off the first team All-NBA. You putting up like 25.6 a game. I think it was third that year behind George Gervin. And Lloyd Freak. And be free. World Be Free. So what happens, I mean, obviously you think you've gone on that trajectory and now you're just going to ride that sky high. I don't think the Bucks made the playoffs that year. 
But what happens that that offseason going into the next year? Well, we had a lot of injuries uh, that year, specifically Dave Myers, who was my, my running mate at Ford, uh, passed away a few years back of cancer, and Myers' his older brother. But uh, he didn't play that whole season, had some sciatic uh, issues in his leg and back. And we were just undermanned and had a, um, you know, John Gianelli was playing center, former New York Knicks, but he's a 6'10", like, you know, maybe 220-pound guy trying to battle the Bob Lanier's and the big behemoths of the day inside. So anyway, so that year, um, but, but what happened before that, Joe, was that uh, my, after my rookie year, uh, Don Nelson uh, had me meet him down at Loyola University. It's where the uh, Bucks were having their uh, practices for summer league. So like, MJ, come on down. I want to want to just you know talk to you a couple things about your jump shot. So back in those days, I mean, my shot was here, and it was like a lot of wrists, just kind of a nasty when I look back on it. It was just and it was you know it was efficient. I could knock it down, but it wasn't aesthetically the, the the best thing to look at. So he worked with me this one practice and said, what I want you to do now, is just think about snapping your whole arm instead of just shooting with the wrist like you do, just snap your whole arm through. And man, that was like the biggest revelation as far as shoot. We didn't have shooting coaches. There was no mm. easy money sniper or, or, yeah. or who's the guy, I forget. Lethal the shooters. Dave lethal Hoppler, shooter. Dave Hoppler. Yeah, lethal, lethal shooter, Dave yeah. Hopper. None of that going on. And so I had no clue what I was doing right or wrong. I'm just, you know, it's going in. I'm averaging, you know, almost 20 and 10 my rookie year. So, hey, I'm good, 55% from the field. So when he showed me that, I went out to uh, this junior high school in Malibu. I was living in Malibu at that time. So me and Ed Waters and a couple of high school buddies, Larry Bowles, went out and played some, um, some, some knockout, you know, just kind of messing around on an outdoor court after he showed me that. And I started using that and I couldn't miss. I mean, it was just like, man, okay, this, this is, oh, okay, this, this is all, this is. And so, so, I, so now all of a sudden I got a jumper. Now, so not only am I 6'6", six, six not only am I 6'6", six, six and athletic and, 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 and a garbage man extraordinaire, you know, buckets, buckets, all, you know, post up, back to the basket, buckets, jump hooks. Now I got this jumper and this confidence in this jumper. Mm-hmm. And so I came out that second year and the first six games of that season, I had 30 or more, 30 or more points. And that's, it was a record until Giannis, yeah, yeah, I remember. Giannis might have tied it in terms of starting a season with 30-point uh, games. They flashed it on some of the national broadcasts at times. But that's because of that, that jumper that, that, that Nelly had told me about. And so, so I'm lighting them up. I'm giving them 30s, you know, averaging 26 a game. And, and me and George Gervin, who's a good friend of mine, Lloyd B. Free, we're talking about who's going to lead the league in scoring. Uh, that year, George did. Lloyd was second. I was third. And then I'm like, next year, I'm going to average 30 and come back and, like, show y'all and blah, blah, blah. Just friendly kind of, kind of competition. Uh, but before that next season, Don Nelson, my coach, brought me in the office like, MJ, Great year last year. Looking forward to this year. What do you What do you What are you thinking? I was like, Hey, I'm, like, I've worked hard this summer, coach. I'm 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 average close to thirty a game. I, you know, I average twenty six. Second year, I'm gonna give him thirty this year. He's like, Well, I have no doubt in my mind you can do that. But this is what I want you to do. I want you to average twenty. Give me about seven rebounds a game. Play some solid defense, and let's kind of spread the wealth, spread the scoring out a little bit more, and have a little bit more balanced scoring. And I did that. Now, looking back on it, I wish I would have met him in the middle, you know, and said, like, well, I could average 30. You want me to average 20, so I average 25. <laughs> you know, let's, let's, let's settle on 25. But so you look at my numbers. I went from that 25.6 next year, like 21, mm-hmm. 20, 21, 20.8. 20. And uh, but that was at the specific behest of, of my coach asking me to rein in the numbers. Now, I look back on that and, 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 and Don Nelson, you know, I love coach. Nelly was a great coach and really helped me a lot in terms of where um, he came into my life as a basketball player. My rookie year, 21 years old, was his first full year as a coach. And he was really uh, interactive in terms of, uh, MJ, what are you seeing out there? If I come out guild and I have a turnover trying to split two guys and do something, time out, MJ, well, what are you thinking? Well, I thought I could split these two guys, coach, get into the gap up in the air, no look and throw a pass to my left. He's like, Okay, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't do it, but yeah, I, I, I get that, I get that, okay, that's fine, that's fine. But he was that kind of coach. But looking back on it, I you know, often look back on it, Joe, and think about, you know, in terms of what was going on with the league, racially, with Ken Benson being the number one pick as, as, as just kind of a, a decent to, to good caliber center. Um, you know, if, if, if I were a white guy, averaging 26 points a game, 22 years old, 23 years old, first team all pro, I don't know if that request would have been made or if it was made, 
I almost feel like the league would have come in and say, what's going on? Hey, what's going on with this guy? Why is he, why is he not dropping the 30s that, that, that we, you know? And so, and not to say that it was racially motivated, but there's probably a little bit of a racial component in there somewhere that, you know, and, and I want to, to, to uh, overdo that aspect of it, but I often think that, you know, if, if, if it was a Chris Mullen or somebody like that that was dropping 25 a game on a regular basis, shooting 55, 56% from the field. It ain't like I'm shooting 48, 47, 46. It's inefficient. You know, it would have been efficient 30. It would have been 30 with 56% field goal percentage. Mm-hmm. I, I think I was number one in the uh, offensive box plus minus that second year, whatever that is, whatever stat that is. Yeah, it'd be a lot of stats nowadays. I don't know what the fuck Yeah, yeah, I don't, know. I don't so even fun, know either. What's so funny is I, I, I got that request one year. Yeah. With, uh, flip 29? Side, the, with the, no, so Flip Saunders comes in. Flip Saunders come in, and we had the meeting. And um, they always ask you, what you think you're going to do? <laughs> and I'm, you know, uh, anywhere from like 27 to yeah. 29. You know, um, probably about, you know, 6 and 5, you know. Had a rough year last year, you know. <laughs> right? Um, he was like, you know, um, 20... <laughs> <laughs> 27 and 6. Yeah. We are a playoff team. I said, who's the playoff team? <laughs> 27 and 6. We're gonna be We're gonna be 10 games under. I said, well, wait, hold on. Who's gonna get the extra nine points? Yeah. Which player? He was like, yeah, we're gonna spread it around. Who? To who? Right. I'm asking who. Like, I don't know what yeah. I don't know what film you watched. Right. right. <laughs> There's a reason I shoot the ball all the time right. because the, the team I have. Yeah. So, w- okay, what do you think Antoine's going to have? He was like, uh, he's going to have about 19, 20. That's what he has right now. Okay, what, how about Karan? He's about 19, 20. That's what he has right now. Yeah. Who's taking my nine? Who, who are you giving it right, to? Right. Andre Blanche. You're like, <laughs> who's getting these points? Like, so I was like, all right. Yeah. Okay. I'm averaging 20, 7, and 6. 10 games under. <laughs> what happened? Do you average 20? I'm averaging 20, you 7, did, and so 6. You did what the coach asked you? Yes, and we're 10 games under. Yeah, man. And then. Sam Cassell was like, hey, man, just go average 30, man. Just, just average 30. <laughs> right. And then that's when I was shooting back up and right, the right. game was coming. I was like, because if you're telling me not to do my natural instinct. Right, right. That's, that's the problem with telling the guy, don't, you're saying, don't play as hard as you can right, play. Right. Don't, don't be who you are as a player. Like, just, right. you know, dial yeah. it down. Like, don't right. be 100%, right. you know, like right. 85. Right. And you're right. like, all right. right. So right. now I'm like, I can take you, but a coach told me not to. Right. <laughs> right. But, the, but I don't think coaches understand what they're saying. You're right. telling them if a guy can average 30 and you're asking him, right. what do you think? He'd be like, yeah, I'm going to average 30 this year. And he'd be like, Yo, yeah. you know, average about 20. Right. Think about what he has to do to right. average 20. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and the emotional impact that it has on a, you know, just in terms of, that we talk about buy-in, mm-hmm. you know, am I buying in? If you keep, you know, if, 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 if I know that you're holding me back, I'm first team all pro. Mm-hmm. So now you're telling me you don't want me to be first team all pro. You yeah. know, that's not good enough for what we're trying to do here. Yeah. You, we don't want you to be top five in the world. And it, 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 it has an impact. It has an impact. It, 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 it foments a level of I don't want to say bitterness or anger or anything like that, but you know what I mean. It's, 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 it's huh? no, but the, but that was that was my work, Russell Westbrook stuff. Like, what yeah. is it mentally doing? Yeah, to him? yeah, right, right. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point because because you, you're, you're telling the guy to you, you know to, to rein it in and to hold it back, and and I've trained to play a certain <laughs> yeah, way yeah. and to be. And not again. It's not a. It's not a thirty shooting forty two percent or forty five percent. It's a thirty shooting fifty six percent. And my thing is that if analytics had been around back in those days, the analytics department would have been said would have said to him like, "No, you're crazy. Mm-hmm. He just should be shooting more, yeah. not less. Yeah. He should be averaging thirty five <laughs> yeah. with, the, with, the, with the way he's putting up buckets and putting up numbers and the efficiency he's showing as a player." So it's just it's, it's interesting. And and the and the other thing too, is that so you think balance scoring championship. The year that Golden State won the championship in 1975, Rick Barry led the league in scoring, averaging 30 a game. <laughs> but he averaged you know, five or six assists and uh-huh. did a good job. But, but, but it, you know, so it's not like it, it, it was, it's not like there wasn't a template out there that, that, it, that, that it couldn't be done. It's just kind of how you do it. And if you do it in an e- efficient enough manner, then it could have worked. But again, that's all hindsight. So, yeah. yeah. 
Well, that explains like the drop off of score. <laughs> that's, right. Okay, that explains that. You got these that. great answers, but then I love that you always bring it back to, to answer the question because we'll go all over the place. We got a, a few more for you, then we'll let you get out of here. So we talk about the term point forward. I don't think you've ever tried to take credit for being the first point no. forward in the no. league, but you just created the term point forward. So to tell me about that story, how that happened. And when you look back, there's been a ton of great point forwards, but I would say who is, who is your guy that you say this guy really personifies what that point forward position means? Well, how it happened was uh, the 1984 playoffs against the New Jersey Nets, and they had a couple of defensive-minded guards. We had a bunch of injuries. We had, um, I think, Tiny Archibald had quit midseason because um, he wasn't getting, getting the kind of minutes he thought he deserved. So he came up with a hamstring injury and just he told Lorenzo Romar on the bench, I'm through. Lorenzo, what do you mean? You're through this game? No, I'm through. I'm through for the year. Never came back. Uh, I think Phil Ford might have been on that team, wasn't getting a bunch of minutes. I, think, I forgot who else was injured that year. But So we're going with Mike Dunleavy Sr. Mm -hmm. And Mike Dunleavy Sr. at that time was like early 30s, 32, 33, never ever the quickest guy anyway. So Michael Ray Richardson and Darwin Cook from Crenshaw High School, Darwin Cook, they were just spinning him around left and right, just the pressure and just steals. It, just, it was just, they were giving him fits. So Don Nelson said, look, we gotta, we gotta, <laughs> we gotta, we gotta break this up. We gotta stop this. And so he said, look, MJ, I want you to initiate the offense. And this is how you're going to do it. So if, so if we run the UCLA cut, you know, instead of being the wing popping out, you bring it up the floor, you dribble to the wing, then we'll have Sidney cut off a of Bob Lanier, and you can hit him in the post, and now we're into the, into the UCLA offense. If we're doing uh, uh, the, 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 the horns, we called it Detroit back in those days, you know, you, you bring it down the center of the floor, you initiate, throw it to one side, you cut off a... So, so after he broke it down, each play, how he wanted me to initiate from the forward position. So I said to Don Nelson, I said, so instead of a point guard, I'm like a point forward. And so Nelly was like, point forward. Hmm, yeah, I like that. You're my point forward. I like that. And so that's the first time that phrase was uttered. Now, you've got people, Dale Harris, other people who say that they're the ones that said it first. My whole thing is that if you can find some place where in, in a newspaper article or something where that term is used prior to that playoff series in, in April, late April of 1984, show it to me. You'll, ne you'll never find that because that phrase was never used before that moment in that practice, before I think game three of that series. Mm. Um, and, and, and so that's when the term first started. Now, in terms of Dale Harris, he used Robert Reed, a great 6'7 forward, as his ball handler initiator when he had Calvin Murphy on one wing and Mike Newland and, and these other great shooting guards coming off the of screens. Um, Lenny Wilkins in Seattle, the year we played him in 1979 in the playoffs. Johnny Johnson, a Milwaukee guy, uh, the late Johnny Johnson, his son Mitch is an assistant to play to Stanford. His son Mitch is uh, down in San Antonio now. But Johnny was the point forward. He'd bring it up the floor for Lenny Wilkins and Gus Williams and Dennis Johnson would come off these screens, Lonnie Shelton and Curl and Jack Sickman do a bunch of stuff. So now he, they played that position before Nelson put me in that position in 84, but no one ever used that term is my, my thing that I came up with the term point forward. And that's my claim to fame. But Rick Berry was a point forward in 75, averaging six assists a game. Maurice Stokes, look up some old YouTube of Maurice Stokes in the early 60s, late 50s, playing with the Cincinnati Royals. He's 6'8", 250, bringing it up the floor, starting your offense, kicking it, driving, kick, doing all kinds of stuff. Elgin Baylor was a great ball handler in terms of initiating your offense. Other, other forwards have done that before, but my only thing, Joe, is that, that, that you know, I'm, I'm the first guy that ever uttered that phrase, and it was in that situation, that practice, and I just uh, regret I didn't have, the, <laughs> didn't have the foresight to... Me too, because that would have been a bag of Rooney. You yeah, know, yeah, I would have had this gap fixed. I could have got the veneers, yeah. too. It really looking good. Well, it reminds me of Pat Riley and uh, I think it was Byron Scott when the Lakers had won two in a row, and Byron Scott's like, yeah, we go three feet. And Pat Riley's like, I'm going to go, go trademark that. That's yeah. good. <laughs> and Pat Riley wouldn't that trademark <laughs> Yeah, that's good. Pat Riley wouldn't trademark yeah. it. You know, but Byron he, Scott he gentrified the, the three peat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Okay, three peat. Okay, we'll make some t shirts. All right, yeah. so we got two, two more questions for All you. Right. So you went to the playoffs six of your, your, your first seven years with the Bucks. Then you get traded to the Clippers in 1984. People give me a lot of shit now because I'm a LeBron guy. Obviously, I just wear allegiance to the Lakers. <laughs> and it's like, well, how was you a Clippers fan? It's like, this is all we knew as, as you know, this, I'm two years old at this point, but this is all I knew as a kid. But how do you go from, you know, obviously Lakers got the show winning time now. 
uh, Bucks being winning time to the Clippers under Donald Sterling in, in that whole losing time era. What's the question? So I'm just saying, what was that transition like for you going? You bring, you bring up some bad memories. Start to twitch, start to twitch, start to twitch man. No, no, man, that was, uh, <laughs> whoo, man. I mean, and it's funny because Don Nelson, before he made the trade, he called me up in that, that morning and said, M, I'm, I'm sending you to the Clippers. I was like, oh, good. Nelly, thanks for sending me home. I was like, well, look, before you get all excited, it's not the Lakers. <laughs> it's the way you talk. It's not the Lakers. They do things differently out there. So just, just, just let you know, you know. And so uh, I get to the Clippers, and first, Don, Donald Sterling had lawsuits against uh, Don Chaney, our coach, for a $200 moving expense, had a $500 <laughs> lawsuit against Norm Nixon for a moving expense from San Diego to L.A. Yeah, yeah, but, he, but he, had, he had a bevy of attorneys on retainer and so, you know, he was just, so he settled. So instead of the 600, you know, we'll take, I'll give me 300 and we'll call it a day, you know. And so that was his, 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 his he's a lawyer. That, that was his MO. That's the way he operated. Everything was a negotiation. And so, uh, you know, I've gotten here and, and look, I went through drug rehab in 1982. So this is 1984. 1983, I was an all-star. So it's not like I'm damaged goods, right? <laughs> so I made the all-star team in 83. Went through rehab in 82. Cocaine was, 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 it was a hell of a drug. It was a hell of a drug. I mean, it was, it was you know, all, all the stories about, about cocaine in the NBA in those days are real. <laughs> and I'm, 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 you know, snowfall was real back in those days. <laughs> snowfall was real. <laughs> snowfall was real. Uh, so I went to rehab in 82. 83 made the all-star team, got traded to the Clippers in 84. And, 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 and I remember Alan Rothenberg, the, the uh, vice president or president of, of, uh, of, uh, of the Clipper franchise at that time, they asked me, like, you know, are you doing drugs? I'm like, no, uh, at that time I wasn't. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that, he was like, what time is it, 10 o'clock? No. <laughs> <laughs> he called me at 10, no, I'm good. <laughs> no, so, so I told him no. And so they found out later that I went through rehab, and so they claimed I was damaged goods and tried to, uh, the funny story I tell is we're walking through Westwood, myself, Chris, your older brother, Chris is about 12 years old or something at the time, and Ed Waters, my good friend, whose coach is Crenshaw now. So Chris is like, Dad, can I, get a, can I get a Herald Examiner? Can we get a quarter for a Herald Examiner? Like, here, give him a quarter. He goes to the paper machine, pulls out the paper. He's reading the sports section. I said, Dad, what does rescind mean? I said, rescind means to give something back you don't want. I said, why? He's like, well, the Clippers are trying to give you back to Milwaukee. <laughs> <laughs> so I look at the headline, front page of the, uh, the Herald Examiner. You know, Clippers trying to rescind trade. Clippers want to rescind Johnson trade. So that's the kind of the cloud trying to operate under at that point, just... Uh, that public knowledge that, that I had some drug issues and went through drug rehab. And, and it's funny, when, uh, when that article came out, I, w- I was uh, at home and uh, my pastor, Reverend Wade, called me up. He's like, I read the article, you okay? I was like, yeah. He said, I'm gonna stop by and go for a ride with me. So he came by and picked me up on Innerdale and uh, he took me over to Reverend James Cleveland's house. Okay. And he lived like four or five blocks away up in the View Park, Windsor Hills area. Went in, he's like, uh, 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 you call him Doc. Hey, Doc, this is Marcus Johnson, and he's going through some things. I just want you to sing a couple of songs for him. And then James Cleveland got on the piano, and, you know, I don't feel no ways tired, and sang a bunch of, <laughs> bunch, of, bunch of gospel songs. It was the livest thing. And I, I didn't think it at the time, but when I think back on it, I said so that was my first kind of year with the Clippers under that kind of a cloud. And, and also the first day of training camp, we're running this two on one drill, Gil. And so the defenders got to try and reach in and, and mm-hmm. deflect the ball or do something. And you got two offensive players. So I'm, I'm in line. So I reach in and I kind of jar my hand a little bit. And I tell Brad Greenberg, our assistant coach, like, Brad, this is, this is somebody can get hurt doing this crap, man. He's like, yeah, this is how we do it in L.A. I don't know how you guys did it in Milwaukee, but do, just do the drill. You know, like, all right, all right. So my next time around, I reach in again to try and strip the basketball from the offensive player. I break the fifth metal, metal torso, whatever it is, in my, in my, in my right hand. Uh, the, the, the little bone by my finger and, and um, by my little finger, and I break that. The next guy up, Derek Smith, great player, all-star, passed away a few years back from a heart attack on a cruise. But Derek Smith, the next player in line, he reaches in and breaks the, 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 the bone in his left hand, in his left finger. And that's when they stop. Okay, stop the drill. <laughs> stop, stop, stop the drill. But that's how I started. That was the first day of training camp. So I played that whole year under the cloud of the drug stuff, and then also with a broken right hand. And I'm trying to, like, I got to show who I am, that I ain't on no drugs. I'm going to play with this. And my, and my agent, Willie Dawes, kept saying, don't play till you absolutely heal. When you do play, shoot it 30 times a game, average mm-hmm. 25 a game. Mm-hmm. 
I'm like, no, nah, well, I'm going to get out there and play, man, and tape it up, and I get it hit like once or twice a game and re-injure it and whatnot. So I wound up shooting, if you look at my numbers, I think that was the first time and the only time I ever shot below 50% from the field average, about 16.6, <laughs> which was boo-boo for me. You know, 16.6, <laughs> that was the but, 50%, yeah, yeah, but that, but that, I was about 42 and I was <laughs> but, but, but that was just a, it was a, it was a, it was a nightmare <laughs> kind of a year. And still, so, so then the next year I come back and we have training camp out at uh, Cal Poly Pomona. The first year I think it was at Loyola University. We have training camp at Cal Poly Pomona. We're staying at an Econo Lodge. Now the Lakers are over in like Hawaii or Santa Barbara or somewhere. We're at the Econo Lodge out in Pomona. Paper thin walls. I mean, just the, 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 the worst conditions you can imagine. And um, we're practicing at this newly built YMCA on, on Century in Vermont, the Wine Garden YMCA. One basket is about nine feet. The other basket is about eight feet. This is our practice. <laughs> this is our practice facility, and it was just a low budget, low cut, low rate discount operation that everybody hated playing for. But you know, we tried to make the best of it and tried to be competitive. And we had some good guys. I played with Norm Nixon and Bill Walton and Cedric Maxwell and Junior Bridgman came out with me from Milwaukee. We had a good time, but you're just under this whole cloud of Donald Sterling and. I mean, Donald Sterling would bring in just a group of his friends. <laughs> We're butt naked after a game. They come into the locker room like, you know, they just, you know, be oogling and looking at us, you know. Just, it was just, a, just the weirdest, strangest kind of a setup, man, that you can, that you can, that you can imagine, man. And uh, it wasn't comfortable at all. And um, yeah, yeah. And, and I would actually think to myself, like, man, and this is what I always say, be careful what you wish for. Be like, man, you know, dang, boy, if I could just, if I could just get, a, get a nice little injury where I could get paid, wouldn't have to, you know, wouldn't have to show up to all this bull crap every day. And then that next year hurt my neck, uh, November 20th, and uh, that was it. It was a done deal, and my career was uh, pretty much over at that point. But, uh, yeah, the Clipper days compared to the Milwaukee days was, uh, was a nightmare. Yeah, I remember I was talking to D Baron Davis. Yeah. No, no, not Baron. I was talking to Sam Cassell about the Clippers. Yeah. Right? I was like, how is, it, is the Clippers that bad? He was like, we practice at a YMCA. We put our jersey on a nail. It's like a nail in the wall. <laughs> yeah. And we put our practice. And I was like, so what happens like at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, you want to go practice? He's like, it's the YMCA. When the YMCA closed, that's it. That's it. So we got to go find like the Spectrum Club. And I was like, how do y'all supposed to get better? Yeah. I was like, how are supposed to get better in the off season? Like, I mean, he was like, you, you. <laughs> I was like, y'all worked at a YMCA. He's yeah. like, yo, bro, yeah. listen, this, this was probably the only non-NBA team in the NBA. He said, we're an NBA team, but we're not an NBA yeah. team. I remember the LA Times Magazine had a feature article on Donald Sterling, and they asked him about his players. So your players, I mean, I mean, you know, Dr. Buss, we see how he treats his players. I mean, you, you treat your players like they're your children. You think of them as your kids. He's like, no, I think of them as racehorses. You know, if one gets hurt, you just get another one and depreciate the value and move on. I mean, so it's just, it, just that mindset. That's how it, but that's how it looked when he drafted. Yeah. There was a point where he never actually paid because I, when I came up as a free agent, when I was coming up as a free agent, this is 2003. At that point, he never re-signed any of his yeah. top players. Right. So there was this thing where, like, um, Lamar Odom, half of his team, half of that, this squad yeah. was up for There is Miles and, he and was, Richardson and they, already, they already got win and he said he was letting them all go. He didn't yeah. care. Yeah. And they were like, no, 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 no. You're going to have to spend money. You're going to have to sign someone. Right. You're not going to just let all these free agents go. So that's when I went and they were like, oh, offer me like $55 million to come. Okay. And I was like, oh, no. Yeah, I'm not yeah, fighting I, with that. Like, I just didn't want to play here. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, the friends, all your friends. And I'm like, yo, I'm trying to, like, yeah. I'm really trying to, you know. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking about drafts. Ed, quick story. So, Bedoy Benjamin, uh, we drafted him number two or three that one year. I think Tisdale may have went ahead of him and Patrick Ewing. Mm -hmm. and we were hoping for the ping pong ball so we could get Patrick Ewing, and that was going to turn the franchise around. But, you know, we didn't deserve him, the basketball guys. <laughs> we're we're going to bless. They're going to bless all that. So we wind up with Benoit Benjamin out of, out of Creighton University, yep. I believe. But he's from Louisiana, Monroe, near where I'm from. So that was my Louisiana homeboy. So Carl Shear, the general manager, tells me to come down to the sports arena to meet Benoit, me and Norm Nixon. So we drive down there to meet Benoit. So Benoit, you know, freshly drafted, you know, fresh off the plane from, from, from Louisiana, wherever. And, and so Benoit's first question to me is like, man, call up Kareem, man. Tell him I want to play some one-on-one. -on -one. Just like June, Lakers just got out of the finals. You know? <laughs> call Kareem up, man. Tell him to come play some one-on-one -on -one right now. 
Let me know the cream, you know, but that gives you an idea of his, yeah. of his mindset. So that season, Benoit, <laughs> so Benoit was just, a, he was a piece of work all year long. He was overweight, whatever, whatever. So he wound up um, this one uh, practice, a uh, shoot around at the sports arena. And so uh, we're shooting around, shooting around. Don Cheney calls us over to uh, go through the other team's plays. And so he's like, so Benoit, you're gonna start? And I was like, uh, duck, duck, Benoit's not here. He's like, what? Where is he? I said, I don't know. I'm just letting you know he's not here. So Benoit comes sauntering in right at that moment with a, with a, a plastic brown leather coat, his basketball shorts, his shoes with no socks, with the tongue of his <laughs> shoes just flipping and flopping. They weren't tied up. He comes, he just sits down on the bench. He just looks at us like this, you know? So, so Don Chase like, Benoit, bring it, bring it, get your sorry ass over here. So Benoit comes over there like, what? So, so, so Don Chaney's like, man, see, you the reason the coaches get fired. Guys like you, see, somebody needs to whip your ass. As a matter of fact, and he went to swing at him, and we had to like grab Don Chaney and Benoit's back, <laughs> Benoit's backing up, backing up. But my point is, is that, so, so I'm talking about coaches going there. So Don Chaney was going to go there. <laughs> and so, and so, so Benoit, he went down to the other end. I remember coming to him a little bit later in practice. He's working his ass off, jump hooks. I said, Benoit, you all right? He's like, yeah, I'm fine, man. Yeah, F that mother, man. He don't mean, that don't mean nothing to me. But he's working hard. I've ever seen him work. Mm -hmm. From that point on, Benoit averaged, you can look it up, averaged 23 points, 11 rebounds, four or five block shots a game. He played like crazy. And he gave us hope that we could turn a corner with him as our center. That off season, I call up Don Chaney just to touch base. What's up, Duck, man? What's going on, man? You heard from Benoit? He's like, man, Marcus, that, 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 that dude's on a cruise, man. He's up to like 285. You know, he, he got down to about 247. He's, a, he's back up to 285, man. And that was, that was, that was just kind of it with him. But just that whole, uh, the Benoit Benjamin episodes were just let, brought two left shoes to a game on the road <laughs> at one point in time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just, that's just, his episodes were legendary with the Clippers, man, so. We got two more for you. you got to talk about white man can't jump. Uh oh, I mean, I heard all these things. That man but... said he got two more, two more. <laughs> yeah. Five questions ago. Yeah, right. You're so good. You're so, obviously, you know this is bonding for us. You know, you get to really see what the Johnson family is all about. But you got to talk about white man can't jump. Now everybody knows, and it's funny, man. You talk about all your NBA accolades, college player, you're all that good shit. There's such a crew now that just knows you from White Man Can't Jump, your yeah. iconic character, Raymond. You know, I'm going to go to my car, get my other gun, shoot everybody's ass. <laughs> but what's the story behind that character? Okay, that's a good question. So Raymond is based on a story that you would hear, one of the first stories you would hear as a new NBA player. One of the old veterans or somebody would tell you the story about a guy by the name of Reggie Harden. And Reggie Harden was a, just a, a basketball savant out of Detroit Eastern High School, won three straight, straight city championships, 6'10", 6'11", handle, shoot. One of the greatest players to ever come out of Detroit. But, but, but Reggie had issues with heroin. He was a heroin addict. He got drafted by the Pistons. He never played college basketball. He was one of the first guys to go from high school to the NBA without playing college basketball. Mm. Had a chance to play for uh, Tennessee, which is now Tennessee State, but Tennessee A&I back then for a coach, Hal, I forget his last name, but he was the first, one of the first guys drafted by the NBA, but, but, uh, but he never played for him. And, and so he was, was a creature of the streets, the east side of Detroit, um, you know, pimps and prostitutes and heroin addicts and heroin dealers and that, and that whole thing. Uh, so Reggie was in the throes of his heroin addiction and to the deep throes of his heroin addiction. And what Reggie would do, he would not only rob dope houses, heroin houses where he was buying drugs, he put on a mask, but he would, he would also rob neighborhood bodegas or liquor stores or whatever. But he'd come in with that mask on, it's seven feet tall, and, and with a gun and like, give, you know, give me, give me, give me all your money. Like, so one, one dude's like, Reggie, come on, man. This is the fourth time you done hit me this, this month, man. Come on, Reggie. I, we know it's you. And so Reggie allegedly said, this is a story that, they, that, that, that you would hear how they would tell it. This ain't me. This ain't me. You know, and <laughs> take, take grab the money and run. And so that was the, the basis of that character. So when I saw that uh, in the screenplay and, and that scene, of robbing that store like that with the mask on. I mean, I knew exactly who they were talking about. Now, I've since, as you know, Joe, I've written a screenplay about the life of Reggie Harding and did, did uh, voluminous research on him. And, you know, it's a tragic story because he was a guy, Gil, that, and you can look up the numbers, he gave Wilt his first time playing against Wilt as a rookie, like, you know, 27 and 19, you know. Mm. He was dropping serious numbers on Wilt and Russell. 
And his potential, I mean, Red Arbrock said he could be one of the top three to five centers in the league, you know, within three to five years. So his potential was there, but he just could not stay away from the streets. And, and I, you know, I, I even ran into one of his old teammates who told me, uh, I mentioned a story about Reggie dangling a woman over the, over the balcony of a hotel in San Francisco during a road trip. And so I mentioned this to one of his teammates at the time, and the teammate told me, and I didn't know this until I talked to the teammate, very popular, very well-known guy, he told me like Reggie was pimping, Reggie was pimping back then. Those are, these are two of the women that he had flew in to San Francisco. They were gonna be there for like five days. It was a five day road trip. You know, they're gonna play two games in four or five days or whatever. And uh, so Reggie had flown these women in from these, these, these prostitutes that worked for him from Detroit to service some of the players on the team and one shorted him of the money. He, he, he dangled over the, <laughs> over the back. He was like, you know, where's my money? Don't be trying to shortchange me. And they had to talk, talk him down and all that stuff. So. He was a character, uh, and that's what that character, White Men Can't Jump, was based on. But it's a tragic story because he, he, he died at 30. He went to prison, Jackson State Prison in Detroit for uh, robbing dope houses and doing a bunch of crazy stuff, um, uh, but, but uh, and robbing people on the street. But he went to prison and uh, was coaching the team up there. It seemed like he was getting his life together. Got into a verbal altercation with a guy on the streets of, of, of Detroit, the east side got to an argument and the guy was like, I'll be back. And so he came back with a gun and shot Reggie right between the, right, Reggie was like, hey, you point that gun at me, you better kill me. Bam, shot it right between the, uh, right between the eyes, walked up on him, he was down on the ground, shot him in the head a second time. And that was it, 30 years old, he was dead. You know, but that, that potential, I mean, you look, at, look up some of his numbers, if you, if you YouTube Reggie Hardy, um, was just a spectacular talent that had a lot of potential, but you know, drugs, the streets, uh, the, the, it, it seems, too much it, of a lure. It seems like that era was fun. I mean, I mean, I mean just exciting, just. Yeah, well, there's a story about, about it was still. They were playing, I, I forget, the, maybe the Pistons, I forget who the coach was, but, but he didn't play Reggie in the first half. And so everybody's gathering around in the locker room, you know, and then and Reggie's fuming because he ain't played in the first half, and all of a sudden you hear a big thud on the ground. And you can probably relate to this, but you look up and Reggie's got a three, 347 Magnum <laughs> on the floor of the locker room. And Reggie, and so the coach is like, what's, what's going on, Reggie? I'm like, oh, hey, look, I, I, all I know is I better get on the court in the second half. That's all I know. <laughs> I, don't know what, I don't know what to go on, but all I know. <laughs> and another Yo. time, he had a teammate named Tweety Bird uh, 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 with the Patriots, I think they were playing, but he woke him up in the middle of the night. Gun, uh, Rod Thorne told me this story, the, the great Rod Thorne, uh, NBA executive for a number of years, but had a pistol pointed at <laughs> Tweety Bird's head like, Tweety Bird, Tweety Bird, they tell me you're a racist. Are you a racist, Tweety Bird? You're a racist. <laughs> you a racist? <laughs> Tweety Bird's like, no, no, Reg, I'm not a racist. Like, okay, because you're a racist, I have to shoot you. I have to shoot you. You sure you're not a racist? No, nah, Reg, I'm not a racist. I'm not a racist. Okay, all right. All right, Reggie said, okay, well, Reggie laid down and went to sleep. Like, okay. <laughs> I hate races, almost as much as referees. <laughs> as um, much as referees. Yeah, yeah. So another time, last story, Indiana Patriots, he's suspended for, for not showing up for games and saying my grandmother died t five times and going to funerals for two weeks. I'll be right back, you know. And so they suspend him. And so uh, Mike Storrett is the, is, the, um, is the general manager of the Pacers. So he's doing an interview, like pregame interview, halftime interview. Reggie Harding, he's got on like a red jumpsuit with a fur coat and all this stuff. Like Reggie, you know, would you, don't you feel like you're letting the team down by, by not being available for the playoffs? Reggie's like, nah, it's just Mike Storm, that's his fault. As a matter of fact, I shoot his ass right now. Mike Storm, <laughs> I'ma shoot your ass. It's like they had to go to black. They had, they had to cut the they had to cut the camera and go to black. Mike Storm, <laughs> I'm, 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 when I see your ass, I'm shooting your ass, you know. So he was like, it was just a great Yo, thing. so semi-pro. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But there was a lot of guys, you know, it was, it was some characters walking oh, around back in Lord. those days and some 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 colorful colorful stories and, and, and unfortunately his tragic ending but he was a colorful player so last question and we'll let you dip obviously appreciate you for your time this, you know this I always like just hearing you tell these stories I know people will appreciate it because it's shit that we've kind of talked about growing up but that you know is so fascinating to me but you've been a, a finalist for the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame now a few times I, I know it's kind of wearing on you, but really, when, when you make the argument in the case for you to get in the hall, I think a lot of people don't understand. You gotta consider your entire basketball right. career. That's what goes into it. Career cut short by injury. But, you know, Liddy was with Chris Mullen. I did the Warriors pregame show the other day. First thing Chris Mullen said, yo, Marcus Johnson needs to be in the Hall of Fame. So for you, do you give a fuck about getting into the Hall of Fame? Is it still something that, I mean, obviously you want that achievement, that accolade, but do you feel like you're deserving of being amongst those greats? 
Uh, yes, definitely feel like I'm deserving, without question. Um, you know, when your grandmother was alive, my mother died, it'll be a year, January 5th. Um, you know, it, it was more for her at a certain point. Now, trust me, I wanted to get in for myself also, just to, not only to be amongst the, you know, illustrious names and greats of the game, but, uh, I mean, the Hall of Fame is just, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's a hell of an achievement. But at the same time, it's funny, the, the year I didn't make it, uh, last year when I didn't make it, I met my daughter, your sister Shiloh's game, and um, the phone rings. I'm about to go in and watch her play, and, and I look on the screen, it's Walt Frazier, Clyde Frazier. You know, I'm like, oh shit, Clyde. So, so, so I was like, what's up, man? He's like, man, you know, Clyde, like, look, man, this some, is this some bullshit, man. You need to be in the Hall of Fame. Look, they, they passed over me three times. I was like, f them, f them. You know, I was like, can I, can I quote you on that? Yeah, you can quote me on that. Yeah, you know. And then, then I, finally, I finally went in after that, but Clyde was a guy in the NBA Finals who had a 36.19 assist game seven with the New York Knicks. I mean, that's Clyde. And so he told me he had been passed over a few times and, and, and how he'd gotten to that point. Now, there was, was a point in time, and I shared this with you, Joe, and I shared it with Spencer Haywood, with Bill Walton at Bob Lanier's uh, memorial service in Las Vegas uh, this past summer. And I shared it. It's like, look, you know, I'm at that point now. I may just withdraw my name from nomination. I'm not tripping. I, look, I've had a chance to get in two or three times. It hadn't happened. They were like, no, don't you do that, man. That's a, that'd be the worst mistake you could do. Leave your name in. It's going to happen for you. Just, get, you know, just, just, just stay patient. So I'm going to stay patient, man. But, um, you know, it, it's it's... My peers have validated that, that I could go. My numbers mm -hmm. validate that I could go. You know how that is. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you, 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 know, you, know, <laughs> you know the ball. You, yeah, you yeah. know the real ones. You mm -hmm. know the real ones that, that, you know, the Bernard Kings and Alex Ingle. Alex was my backup in Milwaukee the first, you know, year I got there. He was coming off the bench behind me and, knew, and could see the handwriting on the wall and got out of Milwaukee because he knew he wouldn't be able to, you know, crack that starting lineup as long as I was there. And so, uh, you know, Larry Bird, Dr. J, they all know. I mean, they know. We, we, we went at it, and, and, and I think you look at my numbers, I think comparatively, I think I outscored Bird. I think Doc has an edge on me. Bernard King has an edge. But uh, I looked up some comparative uh, numbers after Eddie Johnson on one of those serious radio shows. He compared me and him like, look, I outscored you, you know. <laughs> I was like, well, Eddie. You know, relax. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Relax. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, 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 but 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 the point is is that yes, I believe I I deserve to be in. Uh, that especially when you look at the whole body of basketball work, being one of the top ten players used to be top five, but now top ten guys that come out of L.A. with all the the greats we've had. College Player of the Year, first Wooden Award winner. You know, first team All Pro. All pro a couple of other times when they only had two all pro teams. They would have had three all pro teams back in those days. It'd have been you know four or five, six times all pro. Mm -hmm. So I mean, based on the whole body of work, yes, indeed, and yes, it would mean a lot to get in, and I'd be honored, and, and that whole thing. And yeah, it meant a lot more if uh, your grandmother, my mom, was still alive. But it would still mean um, a lot to me to be included amongst that number of uh, just uh, great, 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 great players that I've respected and admired and appreciated their skill level for, for years and years and years, all my life. Mm. Well, shit, that about does it. We, <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. Let's get it in. Let's, let's get it. <laughs> nah, but you know, Marcus, Dad, we appreciate you, you pulling up to the show. Thank you so much right, for coming through. Yes, sir. Sitting on the, the pleather, the leathers. <laughs> it's been another episode of No Chill with Gilbert Arenas. We'll be back with more very soon.